All right, today we're gabbing with Louis Staples, one one of the most incredible writers in the Housewives space. He writes about a lot of things, but some of his Housewives writing is some of my favorite stuff to read. Louis was on the show earlier this year. We talked all about The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, season four, and I'm thrilled to have him finally back on the show to discuss a topic that he's just written about. The article's coming out soon, and it's kind of about this era that we're in on Bravo, not just Real Housewives, but Bravo in general. We have a lot of divided casts, and it's causing... A, to be, it's proven to be quite a, quite a challenge for for Bravo. So, Louis, thanks for being here. I'm excited to talk about this topic. How are you? I'm good. All the better for seeing you. I, you know, I was trying to remember the last time we came on, and well, I came on and did the the pod. I gabbed with you, and yes, it, we did the sensational recap after the big. That feels like forever ago in the Bravo world. I mean, I can't believe that was this year. Um, but yeah, no, I'm excited to to be here. Um, I mean, people might not be able to hear, we'll see, because this is an audio podcast, but I've got a very sort of new, we were discussing before I came on, I had a very New Jersey style shirt on. It's got kind of like vegetables and everything on it. So I'm some excited. Some hot sauce, to some tomatoes, some it. lemons. It's yeah, yeah it's you're you're yeah. in character. I'm excited to get into all the all the mess that we've been seeing unfold this season. Um on New Jersey. And as you mentioned, yeah, I've been writing about the the sort of divided cast we've been seeing on Bravo lately and how that's becoming a sort of, I would say it's becoming a regular fixture on the shows that go on for longer than 10 years. I don't know if you'd agree, but it, it's a it's a challenge on these longer running shows, isn't it? Where these casts, uh, the theme of this season of New Jersey has been this kind of division down the middle and ha- have they been able to mend it? And obviously, the answer is no, <laughs> no mending. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, right, right. So, so obviously, we're seeing this on Jersey, and it's it's posing to be a problem for Bravo that they have to solve. I think they they clearly are already thinking about this. I think Andy's like putting it out there that they are like the wheels are turning about how they solve a challenge like this. Where else are you seeing this challenge? Like, where what are sort of the biggest examples that you write about in the piece that's coming out? Yeah. So the piece that's coming out is, um, I suppose talking about these uh, conflicts that are sort of intractable and unresolvable that we've been seeing lately on Bravo. So I think the other big example that we saw recently was um, Vanderpump Rules um, with Tom and Ariana and uh, the whole sort of the tensions that that caused among the cast and the fans with Ariana not wanting to film with him for the most part and certainly not wanting to film solo scenes with him, um, which obviously is so funny because in the real world, that would be completely understandable. But in this... um, in this reality TV world where we're kind of used to um, conflicts being resolved and move on from one season to the next. And I think what we're seeing on the longer running shows is these conflicts that aren't able to resolve in the normal cycle that we're seeing. So as I mentioned, you know, reality stars, they exist in this extremely strange world where their friendships are also working relationships and where um, they are expected to kind of reconcile and argue as one season begins and the next season ends and I think as fans we perhaps sometimes have a bit of an unrealistic expectation of forgiveness um, because you know these people are people like the rest of us but the Mm -hmm. reunion and everything like that is obviously I think part of that is to accelerate these um, reconciliation processes isn't it at the end of every season and try to move on to a new topic Um, but yeah I think on on Vanderpump Rules we saw the situation where Scannable you know we it was essentially the fallout from Scannable season wasn't it so um it was kind of a lot of discussions of things that happened the previous season which as a viewer doesn't always make for the most amazing viewing experience and I think Jersey's fallen into that trap a little bit as well where we're kind of talking about stuff that's already been talked about and talked about and talked about um and in both cases really it's an interesting one and I say this in the piece but it's really it's a it's almost like these arguments are too real in a sense, because these mm. people are really they're If they were just, you know, doing it for the check, they would be able to kiss and make up on camera um, and keep it moving. I mean, I think one of the great examples is the sort of Roni golden years, what I call the golden years when Bethany came back. Right. To go and they had that sort of three or four seasons of like just perfect reality television. And really, you know, like Bethany and Luann were just like constantly saying terrible things about each other and then making up and keeping it moving. And like that's almost the, the more professional reality star experience where as these people are really, you know, the mess in their lives is clearly real. Otherwise, they wouldn't they would just be able to, you know, hug it out um, for our pleasure. But yeah, we're in a situation where there's those two. And lo- looking a little bit further back, we obviously had Potomac, which I suppose is interesting because Potomac hasn't been going on as long as those other shows. Right. Um, and the relationships there are not as long running um i mean melissa and Teresa is obviously a family relationship which makes it a million times worse and then 
Vanderpump Rules is like they've really all been on the show, that main cast for a long time together. But Potomac, I suppose, is interesting because you have to sort of like Candice, who was on the show, you know, came on kind of midway through. And these these relationships, was, which became quite toxic quite fast. And I think that was the ch challenge there. But yeah, looking wider, it's just this thing that I've been seeing over the last, I'd say, year or so, which is this difficulty with people not being able to move on. And I'm not criticizing those people for that. That's mm -hmm. just you know, their truth, I guess. And maybe we don't always like their truth. Like we want them to, we, we want them to kiss and make up and we want to keep it moving. But unfortunately it's reality television and that's not reality. Right, right. I mean, there's so much in there. there there's so much in there. I think that, you know, part of this is, I think, like you said, it's like, yeah, the expectation is conflict resolution. We kiss, we make up, we go on to the next season, we fight, we make up, the, the cycle continues. But I wonder if they're, if part of this, I think part of your argument is that it's more the long running cast members, the long running shows. There's only a certain amount of times that you can really realistically right. kiss and make up yeah. until right. it until sort of the, the kettle boils over. You know what I mean? And um, maybe that's that, that's probably part of it, I guess. I like think it depends like what's happened also. Like right. I think I think Ariana, like I did see her getting some heat on socials this season just because people you know, there was the whole thing, which I also wrote about at the time, uh, sort of Tom Sandoval redemption arc that was right. going on. Um, and there were definitely people online that were not feeling that redemption arc, but there was also people that weren't necessarily feeling some of Ariana's behavior, I think, throughout the season. So I saw her getting a little bit of heat, but for the most part, I think people understood really, like, I mean, what happened was pretty gnarly. Like, I think that most people, most people understood her position there. Um, I think Teresa and Melissa is another different situation also because it's been going on it that's more the situation you say it's just it kind of wasn't any one specific thing that caused their relationships to disintegrate it was really like just constant like things um over over so many years that are also because they've been on the show so long together I think it's kind of hard to extrapolate that from reality the well, being on the show like the show is the the, the original sin is Melissa and Teresa's right. eyes joining the show without without her right. being asked right and so like it is about the show at the end of the day yeah and the dynamic of like that they owe her in some way for being on the show, but then them claiming that they, I mean, there was that whole thing of them saying they put food on her table, like this kind of dynamic yeah. of who is who more um, and who who's, whose show it is, I think is like really like go, goes to the core of like what they're arguing about really, um, you know, whatever, whatever's happened along the way. Um, personally though, I'm going to say just for the record, just to put this out there, I do not think this season of New Jersey has been nearly as bad as people have been Oh, saying. I like it on social like and also I will say this may be like I don't want to contravene my piece but like there have been like conflicts and like uh situations which have gone beyond the group divide like it's not just purely been I mean to be honest with you so far um Melissa and Teresa like haven't interacted or, or had an, at an argument at all um there was the thing about them sending that ridiculous uh, whiskey thing to the or whatever it was to the party housewarming yeah, that was arranged. But like, apart from that, they've not done anything. Um, so it's and even Marge and Teresa, like, they're, I mean, in the last episode, they were sort of having this war of words through other people, but they weren't really talking to each other. And there've been some quite interesting, I think, I mean, and obviously until it got physical, I think the argument between Jen and Danielle was quite interesting to watch. And I think Jen Fessler's played a really fascinating role. The Jackie um, of it all. It's been... The Jackie of it all. Like, I think there's been a lot of stuff that sort of yeah. happened beyond that as well. Like, enough anyway for me to be interested in in those conflicts and in those situations and have opinions on them but i think the problem is even those conflicts that they are still sort of through the prism of this group divide like even the jackie and marge it's kind of all about her switching teams in the divide and like mm -hmm. even the Esler and rachel stuff that was all kind of like about the divide so it's like the divide is still like the sort of anchor for these other conflicts even if right. they're not really like to that it's like and then everyone when another conflict happens it's like everyone's getting their sort of ducks in a row along the two teams so it's kind of still feels quite like in that arena even if it's yeah. not that way i um, agree with you and, and and our friend our friend brian moylan has always said that every fight <laughs> on the show is about the show which i right. think is like it's, totally it's accurate and fair yeah. but i think there's a there's a line that that bravo probably keeps in mind of like it can't be too much overtly about the show because then you, then you're just kind of going down a slippery slope and i think that, that is sort of like what happened with i mean that's sort of, the jackie stuff is a little bit about the show because it's about her flipping alliances to stay on the show essentially and that's sort of where the 
the Vanderpump Rules stuff came to a head because there was the tension between Lala and Sheena trying to make it a good show by quote unquote making up with Sandoval, but then kind of taking it a step too far, probably in a lot of people's eyes in a real world sense. But those two things are kind of coming to a head. And I think that there, there's a lot of attention. There's a lot of tension in those two things kind of meeting um, on a lot of these different shows. I really think that. No, I mean, Brian, shout out to Brian. Brian is the, the wisest, uh, the wisest yes. the staff, uh, that talks about housewives for sure. Um, you know, he's definitely right there. I think on Jersey, that's definitely the case. And there's this kind of like thing about Jersey that I really don't think Bravo love where it's like, this thing about the bloggers and like mm -hmm. coordinating stuff. And I really feel like when it starts to get into that territory, Bravo has this like sort of wah, wah, wah thing that goes up where it becomes really like they don't want to be involved in that. And I think that that was really the moniker of it all as well. Like really like, I think if she'd been doing anything else other than running a blog, she'd probably still be on that show. It's just like, it becomes too thirsty, too messy, too kind of like, trying to executive produce the show themselves. Um, yeah, it, it, it threatens like, the production. It threatens the, the it like, really the, the, the and yeah. Then it becomes like, and then a sort of side effect of all this stuff, because that stuff never happens on camera, is that they end up arguing about stuff that's happened off camera, and it's all about text and receipts, and it all becomes very, like, almost like it takes away from the show. Um, that's a whole other issue that Rava's been having for a while. I think I wrote about this maybe a couple of years ago is the, the sort of receipts issue that where it's like, it just felt like every single, there was a period where it felt like every single argument on all these shows was just like right. receipts, like text messages and stuff like that. And I think that's also an issue. I think that like, if we could just flip it for a second and look at a show that's doing really well right now, which is OC, mm -hmm. um, I think that it's definitely had a few years in the wilderness as you know as we've all seen i mean it's been a long time in the wilderness i honestly sort of think genuinely if that show was not the first show it might have been cancelled already because right. it had so many years that were like not good not good the fans hated them the ratings were bad um and i think if bravo hadn't if there hadn't been so many headlines like there would have been so many headlines about them cancelling the, the original show and i think it could have created this real sense of spiraling vibes so i think that they stuck with it but i'm glad they did because of course i think if you wait a lot of, if you wait around long enough with these housewives like stuff is going to happen organically which is what we're seeing on that show like i mean you couldn't script it could you like shannon Boudoir crashing her car and then then bringing on the girl that's right, going out exactly her new boyfriend who was also on the show it's like i mean it's ridiculous um and then shannon like looking incredible and like it's just all like all too much. Um, it's so soap opera. But I think away from that, they're, they have done a better job on that show of like keeping it about, like keeping the show about the show. Like I think that it just gets way too, it, even the argument that Jen and Danielle had about that charity thing and how it was like, that. I mean, first of all, that wasn't on the show. And then it was mm -hmm. like all just about this kind of minutia of stuff. And it just felt very like distant from the show that in a way that I just don't think Bravo loves that much but i'm like interested to hear like what do you think they're going to do with jersey like do you want to make any predictions like what do you i think don't i'm not really i i feel like it's for me it's kind of a moot point trying to like predict because it's just sort of like they're probably going to go with the Teresa side because Teresa is jersey but i think that like that's going to turn a lot of people off of the show in some ways i think i don't think it's going to be a full reboot like people sort of want um but, it, but it's hard, again, but like you said, it's sort of like the issue, to me, the issue is not even Teresa and Melissa being repetitive, because we're not talking about that this season. To me, the issue is that once Louis entered the picture, things got a lot darker and a lot more severe and a lot more divided in like a really serious way because of all of these allegations that popped up sort of around the time that he entered the picture. And, um, and that's where it just, it's gotten too much. Um, but I don't know. I mean, and I, and I, I you know, I want to kind of compare two of the shows we've been talking about, which is Jersey and Potomac, because last season of Potomac was its worst ever. Not a good season. Don't need to rehash that. But after that season ended, I feel like everybody was sort of like, OK, they got to take some time, figure it out, like kind of do a slight do a kind of big reboot. And they jumped right back into filming. They fired Robin. Candace bowed out before they can make a decision about her. And then here we are with like most of the cast returning and there was a big divide on that cast. It was kind of Wendy and Candace and then Robin and Giselle and then everybody else sort of slotted in somewhere in the middle on that spectrum. But just taking one person out from each side and probably a stern talking with production about 
Wendy and Giselle, you got to move forward with one another. That did the trick. Whereas on Jersey, that wouldn't do the trick. You know what I mean? I think so. I think it would do the trick with everyone apart from Marge, Melissa and Teresa. Um, really, like I honestly even think Rachel Fuda and Teresa could probably move on. Like, yeah, I well, really do. Rachel that. knows she would have to. Yeah, if she had yeah, to, like, she I would. I believe that. I think that really it's going to be a reboot with. I'm going to just guess here. It's going to be Teresa, Dolores, Jen Fessler, and possibly Jen Aiden as well. Not Danielle. And, I, I think, think Jen Aiden's out. And personally, I hope not. Um, and. <laughs> Uh, possibly Jackie, like possibly, I'm not sure, like possibly Jackie, but like maybe still in a friend of role, but, um, I don't think we're going to see Marge again, despite the fact that she's kind of been carrying, let's be honest, but um, yeah, I really, absolutely. Don't, I don't feel like we're going to see her on the show next season. And I, I mean, I think Melissa's time's up as well, to be honest with you. Like, I just think like, honestly, maybe I'm being too, um, to like micro like looking at the minutia but i just feel like when these people when people go and watch what happens live you can kind of sense from andy like what their future is sometimes on the show like eat before lisa rena got fired you could just or well left but she was going to get fired anyway mm. but, but could just see andy like really not vibing with her on watch what happens live on her appearance and i felt like i didn't see much chemistry between him and melissa or him and um Danielle when they were on the show well him and Jen also I mean the whole thing is that people think that he doesn't like Jen Aiden she's not there's I'd be shocked if she came back and they didn't have good chemistry when she was on the fans love her like not a, a lot of the fans hate her a lot of the fans think that she takes it way really? too far yes 100% no, but my my time my algorithm loves her then every time I log on I see people talking about okay. her but that's the like other thing I don't think they should be playing to the fans online I don't think that they should like they, I think that's a huge that's a huge uh issue but that they, they have do. as well so, so i agree with you they shouldn't but they do like they 100 percent do do that i mean um i spoke to alex baskin in uh for a piece a while ago and actually asked him about all of that and he did say that it does come into it but he did say to I'm sure to be fun, he's quite diplomatic but he did say that there's a lot of like they do a lot of their own focus groups like they are very um like there's a lot of data that they analyze when looking at that type of stuff. Maybe I could see Jan as a friend. I could see her as, her as like a thirsty friend. Perhaps maybe Jan and Jackie as friends. I think Jen Fessler maybe. is definitely staying on and she'll be promoted because people yeah. love her and she's done really well this season. And I feel like she's earned her, what do they hold in New Jersey? I don't even know. They don't hold anything, but I think it's anything. like, let's hold a meatball. <laughs> a meatball. Yeah. She's earned her meatball. Um, And uh, I just think, yeah, you're right. They probably will go with Teresa. I don't think that they could they could end that relationship with her. Um, ultimately, though, there would be a huge financial incentive for them to get rid of like a lot of the longer longer. Yeah, serving. no, that, that, and that, that's the other thing that I was sort of wanted to talk about, which is sort of like going back to the it being sort of the long running people and the long running shows. Like, as the more that somebody stays on a show, obviously, like they get more expensive, their salary increases, and. I think part of this challenge is sort of like this power play between some of the talent and some of Bravo. And, you know, ultimately I do feel like when somebody on the shows issues some sort of ultimatum about like, I'm not going to film with this person or I'm not moving forward with this person. It doesn't usually go in their favor. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, even Teresa last season at the reunion, she was like, goodbye yeah. to Melissa and Melissa came back to the show. Okay. Yeah. exactly you and, know and i honestly think if she hadn't said that she probably might not be kept like i just think that they don't like giving someone the impression that they yeah exactly like, that they do that um no i agree with you um and i think that yeah i mean i wouldn't say i wouldn't say it's fair to say that Teresa issued an ultimatum i mean maybe she did behind closed doors but she she had, she, she did a power play on on camera said, and they said yeah. like you're going because they're going to paint me over you. Um, right, exactly. Honestly, part of me wonders whether it's been a bit of a tactic because I would say she is probably as close to being unfireable as I've ever seen on Housewives. I mean, she's, I believe she's, I mean, is she the last remaining OG? Like, no, she, Kyle. That, Kyle, yes, Kyle. Sorry, wow, Kyle Richards Erasure. She and Kyle are at the probably closest to that I could imagine to being, like, both of them, I would say, are like when they leave those shows i think it's going to be on their own terms if they were to leave right um and i think yeah what she basically said was they're gonna choose me over you and i think maybe like maybe there's a part of 
hey, do you think that could possibly be a tactic? Like just create this big wedge and as sooner or later they'll have to get rid of her. Like, like it can't go on forever. Like on camera, this this thing between them. It 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 just yeah. I think that I think that yeah, they're gonna reboot the show. They're gonna choose Teresa. That's what I think. Um, and I think that you know, then fans will probably complain about that <laughs> because they complain about everything. Fans will complain. That is that is the Bravo gospel. Um, but I suppose, yeah, there's a financial incentive. Like, if you think about the Roni reboot, mm-hmm. I honestly think that they probably paid that entire new cast less than what they were paying Ramona, like 100%. Uh, like, uh, yeah, if you take, Je- if you especially if you take Jenna out of that equation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't believe Jenna's being paid the paid, same like, as the rest, but yes. The other ones are getting paid, but yeah. yes. I would say probably, if you take out Jenna, it was probably like Ramona getting paid, like Ramona's salary or something. Totally. Um, I totally is, agree. You know, I think we underestimate how much these things do feed into decisions now, especially because those salaries have gotten bigger as if, as the years have gone on. Yeah. Um, but I'm interested to see like what happens with some of these shows that are coming back that are filming now there's like a lot of stuff like and that's you know brewing in salt lake and in beverly hills and things like that and i just think it's so fascinating that we haven't heard one single thing from beverly hills like you know if you remember in those winter years i'm not pointing any fingers but Mm. it really Mm. really felt like i'd seen the show before it came out exactly Um, now surprise surprise it's really locked down I don't know what's going on on that show. And I think that's lovely. Like, I'm excited to, like, have this maybe an era of where we return to some of those norms where we don't know everything, where the cast aren't posting everything, where it's not all released. And I think Andy's talked about this in the past where he said he really resisted, you know, them posting stuff. And then I think it became, like, really just impossible to control. And he always said that he really didn't like it at first because it made the shows feel stale. And I actually kind of think maybe Andy kind of really ate with that. Like, I really think that maybe he was telling the truth. I think that it's kind of nice not having as much information. I think it's good to maybe have like basic details. Like we've known that Alexis is filming OC and that's been a big part of drumming up enthusiasm for OC and seeing this kind of Alexis versus Shannon dynasty vibes situation, um, which has been really exciting. But apart from that, like, I don't necessarily know everything that's happening there um i'd love to talk about oc can we talk about oc yeah i mean the last thing i want to say about that topic though is like you know with the Roni reboot it's like yeah they they cut a lot of costs by doing that but the ratings weren't amazing and to save to to kind of to kind of bring attention back to some of these shows like atlanta like oc the way they saved oc was to bring back two huge people that fans love that weren't on the show anymore and then that gets expensive once again like on atlanta they brought back porsche i'm sure she's getting paid fantastically they're they're bringing back phaedra now because kenya's out and sort of like it's this it's this it's this impossible problem and it's impossible impossible equation to solve um it it really is I wrote a long read about this very topic a few months ago, like about the returning, the, the return of the ex-housewives. Um, and it's that, that was the piece I actually spoke to Alex Baskin for because uh, they've been, you know, wives returning on OC and um, mm-hmm. things like that. And uh, yeah, there is this constant, I spoke to some other people at Bravo as well, um, sort of executive and things like that. And it's this constant tension, I think, that they have between this, the fact that people are so they love the nostalgia of of these old cast members but then also they don't want to be you know defined by the cast so right. it's this really difficult thing that keeps happening and also to quote brian moreland again god brian he might as well be on this show uh, but he <laughs> he has this he's really against bringing back cast. We, him and i've had debates about this all the time but he's very ideologically against the the concept of bringing back cast mm. because he thinks that there's always a reason why they got fired and realistically it actually doesn't they don't change um <laughs> like like and the, most of the time they show us exactly why they got fired when they return i mean i think uh yeah kenya maybe is is a good example of of that but um i think that it can be done i think on oc it's a good example of i mean to be honest with you i think they got that wrong when they let Tamara go the first time. I thought it was a weird, strange decision. Um, I think that it's different when it feels like it's very much the right decision to fire someone and then they bring someone back. Because, I mean, 
personally so I love Dorinda but I, I kind of feel like every time every chance she every chance she gets on Bravo again she kind of shows people the reason why she got fired I'm exactly, like exactly you know, exactly the opposite of that like that that's the assignment like mm -hmm. to be like the sweet show, show you show you've learned shown you've grown yeah, like, show, show you've you reflected have exactly your, have your redemption moment like yeah like seize, seize the redemption moment she always has this way of fumbling the redemption moment, which is also just very Dorinda but like um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of why we love her but also why we have difficulties with her but I'm very excited to see I mean I've heard they have like a two drink limit on the traitors or something so <laughs> yeah they do they do she, yeah how she handles yeah. that um, right but um, right but yeah, I think on, I think I think with OC, it's with Tamra, it's sort of like I do agree it was an interesting decision when they initially did let her go, but also I think do think there is something to be said about letting somebody feel what it's like to not have that in their life, and and sort of I think she came back so strong because of that feeling and because she knew what it was like to to have it be taken away from her, and she came back and gave OC its best season in so long, and yeah, for sure. you know. And I she gets a pass now honestly i think yeah. that now the fans especially last season because i'll be honest with you she was in the wrong last season yeah like, she was she was nasty to heather Shubro and like really tried to do this kind of like lisa vanderpumpian like take very much for, that but forgot that the cat the the, the 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 key to doing a lisa vanderpump takedown is that you have to convince the audience as well not just mm. the cat where she failed at convincing the audience, but totally convinced the cast. But what Lisa Vanderpump was so good at was like s somehow making herself look like the victim in the eyes of the cast and the audience, um, which, you know, is a, an amazing feat. But um, the, yeah, so she, I think she gets a pass because people are like, wow, I can't believe you guys are dragging her when like this is what happened. And then she got let go. And then this, the show massively suffered for it. Um, right. So I think that yeah, she definitely gets this sort of pot stirring past now where people just expect her to do that um we need so her they, to do it right exactly we need her to do it um and i think that she she like she has the yeah, almost like a i'd say she's if there's if Teresa and kyle are the most unfireable i'd say she's like a little bit behind but not too far behind because i feel like if they fire her again that's really it and i don't think they want to take that risk right um so yeah, I think she's got a little bit of immunity for a while. I mean, I think that there would be an interesting thing, wouldn't there, if you sort of, I think with these housewives, how they're employed like one year to the next, it's like creates this sense of precarity, doesn't it? Where there's almost like uh, people feel like they have to, you know, really bring it every season and sort of uh, have a crescendo at the end. Mm -hmm. and I spoke to Tamara about this when I interviewed her for that piece I mentioned about returning housewives and she was telling me all about how you know people would come to reunions with like all these pre-scripted lines and like like really like like if they felt like they hadn't brought it during the season they would act like totally different at the reunion and all, there's all these sorts of tactics that people would play to have their kind of moment and stay on the show and I think it'd be really interesting if you had like three-year contracts for some housewives like how much that would change their behavior like mm. would would like you're safe this season but right. yeah, exactly like it's like you know on like when on game shows when they have like you've won immunity from next week's elimination like if there was honestly like though where, if there was something where you were immune from the next season firing or something like i would be so interested to see how that would change their behavior i mean it would likelihood it would make them like really boring which then we would complain about so i mean it's a loser <laughs> but um right yeah right. I mean, if there's one thing that we're going to do it's complain um but I think that Heather Dubrow is also, I think, yeah, once you come back, I think there's an interesting thing where once you come back to the show, like, I think that you do have a kind of almost like raised status in some way. Like Completely. Heather and Tamara both kind of have this status where the next time they leave, I think it will really be on their own terms. Um, and I think that they both bring something really important to that show. Um, Heather obviously has the whole just opulence thing mm -hmm. that's become... I mean, she definitely has a lot more going for her as a real house. Like, she's an amazing real housewife for loads of different reasons. But the whole, like, can you believe how many places we're living right now? Like, all that, <laughs> all that like, ridiculous shit it's amazing. is, just, like, so part of, like, who she is. You know, Fancy Pants, the persona, um, it's just so part of who she is. Um, it's also just, like, so, it's so part of the DNA of, like, original housewives. It's, like, we, we as much as we want to, like, as much as people maybe don't want to yeah. admit it, like we we want the aspirational, we want the affluence, we want the sort of escapism of right. that, and she she brings that so purely to the show that pretty much nobody else really can. So it's you know it, yeah, there's also, it, that's a huge factor. Like a level of wealth that is like I mean even on Beverly Hills, it's like it's like she's giving everyone a run for their money and mm -hmm. uh, run for their money. And um, <laughs> I think that, um with her, it's 
Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think that this is a piece I've always wanted to write, actually. So if there's an editor listening, please hit me <laughs> up. But I've always wanted to write about the sort of wealth divide in Housewives and how, um, you know, there's some franchises where it's more important than others. And there's some, yeah, there's some franchise, there's some people where it becomes like an issue if they don't have enough money, like Gina, for example. Right. Um, also, then there's an issue of authenticity, like, is it realistic for Gina and Heather to be like hanging out together the whole time? Where, like when there's this huge difference between them, like, I don't know, like, I honestly don't know, but like um, it becomes like an interesting kind of dynamic. It's like a where... subtext. It's like a subtext of it. Yeah. Yeah. And also this thing of like, I think there's some franchises where there's really not, I mean, I saw, that's another thing I saw people complaining about a lot with Potomac um, last season, how, there wasn't, there were people were, I thought it was really interesting. People were explicitly saying, and I hadn't really seen this before, like, where's the wealth? Like, where's the opulence? Um, and I had kind of, I knew that that was a sort of undercurrent of the housewives um, appeal, but I didn't, I hadn't seen people explicitly sort of like calling out the like lack of glam. Like, I mean, Jen, it was definitely like a pre-scripted line, but it was so good that I didn't really care. The, the like, what did she say? Like, as someone I thought as somebody who used to live in a casino would, would understand. Yeah, I you would understand or something, which was <laughs> right. like, I thought that was very funny. Um, right. But I think that just to defend Gina a little bit, I think that was why she was annoyed about it. Because she was saying, when I got divorced, I lived in a casita. Like, I sacrificed my mm -hmm. lifestyle and I, like, clawed my way up or whatever. Well, that's her how she views it. You know, I clawed my way up and got myself back on my feet. And here's this woman that's just like expecting everything to be done for her. I think like that's really what she's annoyed at. I think for sure. with Gina, my psychoanalysis of Gina is that like everything in everything about her, she's still not over her divorce from Matt. And all her anger towards other women is always really that's the subtext is like something to do with Matt that she's not over. And I think that this whole thing with, Jen is really like about her, like uh, maybe some residual trauma from mm -hmm. everything. You know, it must be really hard when you're with someone and you have a certain lifestyle and then you're in a casita and then there's loads of people making fun of you online and then you get a DUI and then your hair is horrible and then it's all like awful. And then you claw yourself back up and you get skinny and get an amazing bob and then everything's fine. But then maybe it's not fine emotionally. So I think right. that with Gina, maybe it's like a little bit of residual Kind of she's worked and, on the outside and but not necessarily yeah, on the it's inside going to see someone who's making mistakes that you purposefully tried not to make yourself so i think that it's really for me it's more about gina's kind of yeah her past and yeah I think and, and i think subconsciously i also think that she kind of she's eager to not be that person in this group anymore the person mm -hmm. with who lived in the casita who had the bad hair and all this stuff now she has a group and, and i think that she, she like i'm a success now Jen, right but i think yeah exactly i think that she's there's a subconscious aspect of it where like she wants jen to be that person now but jen sort of like doesn't want to look like she's that person or live like she's that person but there's a tension in there somewhere where gina sort of wants to be supplanted in that that role like the kind of quote bottom of the rung in terms of like the the economics and the finances of it all so it, it it's very fascinating yeah i mean this goes back to the whole wealth of it all doesn't it like that how like money is like mm -hmm. feeding into um i just think that like what those women want for jen is for jen to be single on her own yes. and like prioritize like make it on her own basically mm -hmm. um, but like tamra said that and i was a bit like let's just like be honest with what happened with you what you got with eddie and then you opened a gym together like as a couple and eddie already had his own money like i don't think eddie was like s enough to like you know like support like i don't think it was like i don't think she i'm absolutely do, do not think she got with eddie for the money obviously they're very in love mm -hmm. but like they like you know found each other a good time for her and realistically they started a business together and things like that so she did also find somebody else that was like there after Simon. It wasn't like she was like completely on her own, like clawing her way up, like on her own. Um, and, you know, Gina also found Travis. So like there are like there are like examples in the group of people getting with someone else quite soon after the divorce. And it's been like four years. Mm -hmm. um, but I just basically think they don't like her boyfriend and they think he's shady. And I think that there's obviously evidence. They don't want her that. to be dragged down with that either. Yeah, exactly. Right. I think they're worried and also the thing is that in their defense like if eddie and tamra hadn't worked out tamra would have been fine whereas right. with jen it's like 
if things don't work out, she's openly saying, I don't know where we're going to live. I don't know what we're going to do. And that is like quite, must be as That's a friend. That's scary. Yeah. Quite scary here. And you don't want, especially when, let's be honest, it's not like he's had the greatest track record and he's like this blemish free man. He's no, like, of course not. Bit, so <laughs> someone that there's a definite question mark over um, for valid reasons. So I think that they are a little bit trying to give her some tough love, but I'm not sure she's, really the person to give tough love to like some people are definitely that person but i can't and i maybe feel like she's feeling a bit vulnerable um to to do that in the, in the moment and i don't think that they really understood until she was saying like stuff about her credit card and things like that like how the level to which she the direness not, of it yeah yeah the level to which she has not lived as an independent hashtag independent woman but like how much when she was married she had things done for her and now it seems like she's maybe recreating some of those dynamics again but like obviously like what do you actually expect her to do like that is kind of a something that people unfortunately do do is that they repeat those dynamics but also if she doesn't have the knowledge or the know-how then she's gonna need someone else to do it for her but I think that she's gonna be on a journey and I think that she I hope that she we get to see her go on that journey on the show. Like I really Me too. Hope she... I love her. I think she's a great I, I, housewife. I think that she's a great housewife. And the thing about her is that no matter how shady her boyfriend is, no matter how irresponsible her financial decisions are, she is a nice person. And you mm -hmm. can tell when you mm -hmm. watch her, she's a really nice woman and that she has a heart of gold and that she literally wouldn't say something bad about someone unless they said something bad about her first. And I think it was so telling when... Gina, to be fair on Gina, when Gina gave a really, I thought, very, like, she had a lot of humility and basically yes. acknowledged that she took it too far the other day and said that it was, she's got a lot going on and that that was probably feeding into it. But then Jen's first reaction was just complete concern for Gina. Mm -hmm. in, and I thought that that's very telling as a person. Yeah, yeah, it was like, 100%. It shows me that she's a really good person. And I think that the, you know, if there's one thing Housewives fans like, it's that kind of plucky underdog, um, um, story and I think that she maybe needs to just be a bit more of a plucky underdog and not like a kind of sad underdog I think that she you know we like that kind of you know Bethany Frankel style woman that's like hustling her way out of a bad situation and I think that if she could maybe unearth her inner hustler that we would <laughs> yeah more, more I, I do think I, yeah I think it's kind of remarkable how like she does not really carry an air of sadness about her overall given what's going on behind closed doors and i also you know, think that you know, i think that she's quite sad to me she's I, sad. I, we've seen sad moments but like i don't see her in like a group setting with like a with a bunch of the girls and i don't think she seems sad to me but i do oh, think that I'm one of the things that like, one of the emits sadness like like, like oh I, I i don't see that but like, okay. yeah personally but i i do think the other thing that i really love about her is that like she is that underdog we want to root for like you said but she also is like so just like so open about it all just like kind of like in a naive way that like you want that you want to root for she is so open about everything she just kind of presents it she's an open book and maybe that's to a fault but it makes her a good housewife it makes her good for the show i completely agree with you. and this is something else i've always wanted to write about is this kind of the fact that sharing and this is so oc the fact that sharing no matter what happens in the housewives world right but well within reason i mean you couldn't like <laughs> Or the Jen Shah is the limit, I would say, of, of this. But and in fact, maybe she isn't. I'll explain. But sharing is like this huge currency in not just the Housewives world, but in reality TV. And I think on franchises like Housewives, what we what we tend to see is that when the women start out on these shows, especially the ones that started out at the beginning when it wasn't such a sort of cultural phenomenon, mm -hmm. um, you know, they shared a lot more. They, you know, if we look at the first seasons of Beverly Hills like the level of sharing on that show was like Taylor filming days right. after her hung himself Kim, uh Kyle and Kim Kyle calling Kim our and Kim as an alcoholic in a limo in a screaming row pulling down her dress running out um you know uh Kelsey and Camille like getting divorced uh, on the show like you know the level of like kind of rawness and intimacy that we got from those w very already wealthy women in the beginning of that show was really something similarly 
OC, like those early seasons where people were getting served like eviction notices on the mm-hmm, mm-hmm. cameras rolled. Um, you know, we we got we had a lot of access um to these women's lives. And I think what's happened over over the years, and as as a lot of the cast have had, frankly, they've got more to lose now, and they've got, you know, businesses and their influencers and a public profile. And uh I think it's a mixture of them having more to lose and then also feeling like they don't need to share as much because they've already shared a lot. Um, mm-hmm. I think, for instance, last season on OC, we actually saw Shannon kind of saying that. She was like, I don't want to share, you know, all that, the stuff that had been said about John. She, you know, when she took her mic off and stormed off and said, she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've shared so much on the show, which is totally true. She has, but it was kind of like, I've done enough. Like, I don't need to share this. Like, I've But done you have enough. to keep sharing to stay on. You do. Right. Yeah. But... As we're seeing with her now, we're seeing this immense fan loyalty to her totally. because of how much she has shared on the show and the fact that she is continuing to share mm-hmm. this. I mean, someone like Luann is really interesting also. Like her, her whole brand could have become completely toxic after she was arrested and all of that. But instead, because she shared in such a raw fashion all of that and then shared her eventual sort of comeback story, we ended up really having this deep connection with her. Um, Teresa is also a great example, sharing going to prison, sharing all the legal stuff. So if you think about the housewives that have like really that have the most loyalty from fans, it's often ones that have sh- shared for years or shared their most difficult years on these shows, like divorces, deaths, right. you know, really gnarly things. Yeah. So I think that what we're seeing now on OC with Jen is a good example of that, that like, yeah, if your life's falling apart, like that's awful. But also if you share that with us, then we will repay you. Immediately with, like, endeared. Immediately endeared. And we'll repay you with like a loyalty because we respect it. And I think that's it, what happened with Monica. That. That's what happened with Monica. Okay. I mean, she, she was a huge fan favorite despite not coming back for another season. If she hadn't done the the whole social media account thing, reality von tees, she would have come back and could because of that same reason she opened up her life that was so messy and so raw in a similar way to Jen and like right. I think that that's something that like I think about the new Roni women who like I like all of them I think it's a solid cast but like I do think there's a wall up with every single one of them if you, you know back to that season that is such a good point that you raise because there was arguments on the show about sharing between yes. Sai, and there was this interesting thing where there was almost a misunderstanding, I think, of what real sharing is. It was like mm-hmm. your entire backstory. But to me, it's not really about sharing your it's backstory. It's not. It's about sharing your life now mm-hmm. and like what's happening with you. Like Jessel, mm-hmm. I would say, is the exception on that show because she shared so much, you know, with the IVF and you know, she had that sit down with her mother and things like that. So I would say she, um, but I would say she was the fan favorite then because she shared the most. Whereas, yeah. Jenna definitely, although she did share a lot of stuff about her past and being outed and things like that, there's definitely, you know, a wall up with her and, you know, in the upcoming season, we're not going to see her relationship. Exactly. And, like that. and that's such a it's weird precedent for everybody. Exactly. It's like... Yeah, although I will say, I don't think that sets a precedent. Like, Bethany has not shown her relationships in the past. I, th- like, I think I think by I think by making it a known thing that was put yeah. out there, where she went in an interview and she said... I have this relationship and Bravo has told me that I don't have to share it. Yeah. That sets yeah. a precedent. That, that's yeah, a weird... No, I yeah. I would say it's, she's not the first person to not share no, their relationship. No, I agree. She's the first person for it to be like a thing. A known thing. Yeah, exactly. No, I think that's definitely fair. That's a good distinction. But yeah, I'd say the Roni thing is a perfect example of the fact mm-hmm. that like it definitely felt and that they were noticing it as they were filming that some people were sharing more than others. But then also that I think that they were misunderstanding the assignment of what sharing. I think sharing. you're right. Um, and actually, like, I think at the reunion, there was a lot of sharing that felt much more authentic because I think some people got their asses whooped by the fans and were yeah. a bit surprised by that. And I think that there was more genuine. I think, yeah, if we're looking at the two the two women that I'd say were most endeared to the fans, I would say it were Bryn and Jessel. And I would say they, they were the people that I think shared in the most authentic way on that show. You're right. So I think... And the Monica thing is interesting because she's an example that I kind of forgot about by what we were talking about earlier about conflicts because essentially she got kicked off that show because the women were like, I mean, there was no way. They, was, yeah, was they rallied against her. her. Yeah. Um, but you're right. She would have definitely been kept on had there not been that situation because she was such a sharer. And even like Jen Shah, I think the thing that really got her in the end, like I know that Bravo would like to say that it was because she was found guilty and whatnot, but really i think it's because she she lied on the show first of all the whole time then didn't let them film mm-hmm. the bit that, that was really crucial when she changed her plea mm-hmm. and then didn't show up 
to the reunion. So I think it was really like her actual lack of sharing that was the key to severing that professional relationship rather than being found guilty. Although to be honest with you, I think they would have had a hard time keeping her on the show once she'd played. Oh yeah. <laughs> that would have been... I think that they perhaps would have, yeah. they would have definitely wrapped up the story in a, in a way with her own. Like they would have had her explaining why she changed her plea or like what, like they would have had it in some way, I think mm -hmm. that would have mm -hmm. been different. Um, but yeah, this whole, the, the, this idea that sh sharing is a, this huge currency and also that I think it's a currency that's rising in value on Housewives as this as the years go on. Because as you mentioned, these newer reality stars don't share as much, I don't think, um, always. I think Yeah, because they want to be almost, brand safe. I, yeah. I think though, if we look at, just to jump out of the Housewives universe for a, a second, like The Valley is another example of a show right. where everyone was sharing so much that it was almost like, I couldn't quite believe. Put it I was back watching. in. Put it back in. Right, exactly. Like too much sharing. It was yeah. like over sharing. So um, true. But like, it was almost like I wasn't. I was watching it, and it was like I wasn't really sure if I was even enjoying it. But because they were sharing so much, it just felt so intimate in a way that just really was stimulating. In a way, yeah. like I couldn't even say it was like an enjoyable viewing experience. But I, because so much of reality TV, not just on Bravo, but in general, feels less organic. The fact that they were having these kind of huge rows in a corridor with the camera all like you know it felt very mm -hmm. like school in a sort day of way. one yeah exactly it felt very like early vanderpump rules levels of mm -hmm. people not what they've got themselves into um so i yeah. think that there's an interesting thing there where like and the the cast i don't think it's very interesting that they didn't do a reunion in that sense because maybe they just wanted them to keep sharing it on on the show i think um, you're right i mean really inter i mean you, so you need to tell me the gossip what is the goss about this watch party? Were you not? Were, were you there? Did I see? No, that? no, 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 you no, no, no. It's party? it's not like there isn't like actually like a party. It's just like it's just the women watching the right. finale. So yeah, I wasn't sure whether there, there was like two rooms and then there was like an after party or something because I saw photos of you somewhere and I was like, is that the? Oh no, no, there, no, because no, because no, it's it's confusing because it's confusing because Bravo has been hosting their official watch parties and they've been inviting I, some I, of the talent I there and Melissa watch. was at that in New York Indeed. with some with with Jen and Vicky and Shannon. Like, yeah, filmed it and then had. Oh some, no, like, they, but that but that was filmed the night before. So okay, so so we went so we we went to the. We went to the official watch party. It was Melissa, Vicky, Shannon, and Jen Hermosi. Then the next day, it comes out that they had filmed the watch party with the Jersey women on Monday. This was on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, we find out. So, like, Melissa had done those two things back to back, basically. But we didn't know that they had just filmed that the day before. So... Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. So, was there did anything anything get said about the? No, because no, because we didn't know about it. We didn't know that we nobody knew about that. Like even the people who I was talking to who work at Bravo, we weren't. I didn't. It was very tight lipped. Yeah, I'll be really interested to see how this works. I mean, on paper it sounds awful, but like I I'm gonna reserve judgment until I see. Yeah, me too. It but, um, it sounds like yeah, it's not something. But I mean, I mean maybe it'll be fine. Like, I think we'll it'll see. be fine. Oh, yeah, there won't be much conflict. But I think maybe that maybe they'll. I think it'll be a nice breaking the fourth wall situation to to sort of send some of these women out. You know what I mean? That's it'll what help I think. Teresa because she always like fumbles the bag at the reunion. I think so. Like I think part of the reason why Melissa stayed on the show is because Melissa performs very well at reunions. She's right. much more she's much more quick on her feet than Teresa is. Shall we yeah. say she is? You know. She's got to come back for everything instantly, whereas Teresa, I think, is a little bit more needs more time. <laughs> um, yeah, she needs more time, and she also needs like her backup, kind of like she's a little right. strong. You know, Louis comes in or whatever. So yeah, um, she, I think, but then she'll, she'll have so she won't need to be arguing with an actual person, and she'll also be in her her people. So I think that it'll probably help her in in some ways. But yeah, probably. Um, I'll be interested to see. Like, yeah, I just think that it's interesting the dynamics there i'm gonna be interested to see how weird it is with dolores like running between the like uh, this is gonna be like really funny i mean it's like, kind of what she did in the most recent episode where she went from Teresa's house to, with the lawyer talking about margaret to, right to margaret's house to tell her what happened so that might maybe we'll get some of that yeah a really interesting example of and i think this is quite rare so it speaks to like her skill as a as a person on that mm -hmm. show as a sort of i would say she's kind of like a matriarchal figure on that show um but like, it's quite rare that someone 
can not only sort of make a brand, but like be successful at being Switzerland in a way that totally. doesn't up that doesn't upset the fans or doesn't make them seem boring. Um, so I think that she's done a really good job of really. Like, I job. mean, I'd say Karen Huger is a good example also of someone that like doesn't take. She side. is the fence exactly. <laughs> yeah, she is the fence. Yeah, so um, yeah. She, I don't ride the fence. Um, so yeah, like th these two women are both, I would say they have a kind of matriarchal presence on those casts. Um, and, and come I from the same cloth too. I think there's actually similarities. Yeah. Some of it. yeah. I think there's similarities. And I think that they have a real kind of definitely a fan loyalty and that they, do they don't necessarily need to be so explosive the whole time. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, what, what gives them that right in a sense, because that's, <laughs> that's not something that all the housewives, I'm sure a lot of the housewives would love to like, exist in a world where they don't have to take a side and they don't have to like have huge arguments the whole time because and not be branded a flop or whatever so it speaks to definitely like them as people on, on the show but I'll be I think that it's interesting to see that she's kind of the only one apart from Teresa that people are really saying is like safe on New Jersey. Absolutely um, yeah yeah I so, think you're right because she we'll can really, because she she's the one who can cross the aisle you know what I mean mm -hmm. like and even if they were to maybe keep someone that's not 100 percent teresa team team tree um she would be able to interact with them so she's um, the bridge yeah exactly yeah for sure and i think that maybe we've lost that a little bit on housewives like it used to be quite common that you didn't have like everyone you know like luann like the, like in the kind of early seasons there was like a lot of people that were not necessarily like the the sort of big drama totally person. yeah i think that yeah some of these shows would definitely work better for having a few more low-key housewives who maybe yeah like stir the pot a little bit go between the group but aren't necessarily like those box office right. like screaming rare people I right, think maybe right. maybe that's social media though because i just find it really annoying the way people brand these women like a flop or whatever if they don't like have a huge oh yeah it's they're so yeah. fickle so it's so black and white it's so it's very like someone like crystal i think is an example of someone who was actually good right. in, an, in an underrated and understated way me too. Like, I think the show she could pop gonna, off when she wanted to. Right, the show isn't going to fall apart without her. Don't get me wrong, and I'm not going to say I'm going to watch it and like miss her hugely. Like mm -hmm. that, I can't promise that, but that does not mean that she didn't add something good to that show. Totally, um, we could find someone else to fulfill that role, but it's not like I think that it is an important role to play. That person who doesn't necessarily have any firm allegiances or firm beefs with anybody. Um, yeah, I think that these shows could do with rediscovering the art of pot stirring in a more subtle way. <laughs> I totally agree. Well, Louis, we, we've talked about it all. I, this has been such a great conversation. Yeah, yeah we really have. <laughs> uh, I'm so excited to read. Oh my God. Your... Sorry to interrupt you, but did you see Ramona like with her New Jersey thing the other day? Oh that yeah. Was, like, yeah. That was the funniest thing I've ever so seen. So fucking funny. No, I mean, she, she insulted like, the entire state of New Jersey. Like, it was like an apology video about it. Like it was yeah. like completely the least self incredible. The Mona thing I've ever seen in the whole world. It was actually hilarious. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. Um, when when can people find the piece that that's coming out that, that we talked about at the beginning of the, the episode? Plug all the things before we sign off. So uh, the piece about conflict uh, in the housewives world in uh, these unresolvable conflicts is, I think, going to be out on Monday. I'm straight after the New Jersey finale, um, and it's going to be on Rolling Stone. And people can awesome. find me on X slash Twitter um, and Instagram at Louis Staples, both on both places. Awesome. Louis, appreciate you always. This is fantastic. And um, hopefully we'll do it again soon. Oh, please. <laughs> I want to gab. 